there's something immensely satisfying in working with clay. Maybe it's the feeling, that dense, liquid, tactile gloopiness. Or perhaps it's the sense that you're connecting with a really ancient art form. Now, building with earth is an equally ancient practice. And much like throwing a pot on a wheel, it takes real skill and dedication. Of course, nowadays, we have all sorts of modern materials that allow us to build houses quicker, cheaper, more easily. So, with all that innovation at our fingertips, who would still choose to build a house out of earth? And perhaps it's those folk who hanker after a connection with the natural, the ancient. Or maybe it's just those individuals who refuse to conform with convention. Whatever the motivation, certainly harder than it looks. On a remote mountainside way off the beaten track in the South Island high country, Lee and Michelle Tane are in their happy place. Together with daughters Thea and Juniper, the couple are embracing the lifestyle they've always wanted in the wilderness. Lee and I met and straight away it was abundantly clear we just wanted to live a simple life close to nature. And I think that feeling has always been there for both of us. We had very, very similar dreams. Plants and gardens, gardens and, and animals nature and, yeah. and conservation, ecology. With Lee being an arborist and Michelle a horticulturalist, they had practical skills to support their vision of living lightly on the land. They just needed to find the right place. And the inspiration for that came from overseas. I'd worked in rural China and got a real appreciation for how you could farm these kind of really steep, remote hillsides and then we spent some time in France. Beautiful little farms dotted all over the mountainsides. So this steep, rugged land that people aren't interested in trying to live on in New Zealand. We'd seen other people do it in other countries and thought, no, we can make this work. While still overseas, the couple saw an online ad for a 50 hectare property in inland South Canterbury. The land was certainly steep, but also north facing with good clean water and fertile soil. First time we came up here was later autumn and it should have been cold, it should have been desolate, but it was lush and green and there were so many warm microclimates. We ended up walking around in a t-shirt and shorts. Leah and Michelle bought the property in 2011 for $145,000. They then moved up and started learning about the land, living first in a tent, then a mud hut, and then two wooden huts. All up, they spent seven years here living off the grid, way off, the last 18 months with baby Thea. It's a pretty cool place to be. Um, it's not what I had envisioned when we started looking for land, I'll be honest, um, but it gives us a scope to keep dreaming, to keep doing, to keep creating. Since 2019, the family, now with youngest daughter Juniper, have lived in the nearest town, Geraldine, a lumpy hour's drive away. But they're up here a lot and have big plans too. One day, stay for good. You know, I've got a huge sense of anticipation here. I feel like I've just walked along the Southern Hemisphere's longest driveway. This place is seriously remote. Hi, how are you? Hey, g'day, Tom. G'day, Tom. G'day, Lee, Michelle, and the most important person, Juniper. Today, we're up in the cloud, but I'd imagine on a clear day, this is pretty special. Usually, you'd have a pretty good view. We've got some mountains out this side, Mount Walker, and then further up through the end of the gorge, you've got the Sherwood Range. So you usually see some snow-capped mountains up there. What are you going to build? We're doing a rammed earth house. Rammed earth? All with our own timber that we've collected over the last few years. Yeah, I've seen a bit of that on the way up. People will be really jealous of that at the moment. You just can't get timber. 
and you've got everything. I'm a hoarder. <laughs> right, and, and a great thing to hoard at the moment. OK, so where's the house? Just over here, tucked up against the bank. So we've got plenty of space for, for gardens, landscaping around the front. How big is it? We're about 100 square metres, yeah. um, just over. It's going to be lovely to have the luxury of a high finish home in such a wild space. Liam Michelle's building site has been cut into their steep 50 hectare block, about halfway down. All exterior walls will be rammed earth, as well as some of the interior walls. The rest will be a mix of elm, cherry and ash from Lee's timber stockpile. Most of the floor will be polished concrete. The back of the house contains the laundry, bathroom, children's bedroom and master bedroom. While the open plan front features the living room, a large designated play space and the kitchen with ash floorboards, walnut cabinetry made by Lee and a wood burning stove for heating and hot water. Large windows look out over the patio, with outdoor furniture in prime position for the widescreen mountain views. Lee's stockpile also contributes oak for the exposed beams and the sarking boards which line the heavily insulated mono-pitched roof, capping off this rustic yet crafted off-grid and future-proof family home. It's a fascinating project here being up here in the mountains, so far away from everything. What does this life bring for you? Um, simplicity, really. It's about building something for longevity, building something for the climate, nice and warm in the winter, yeah. cool in the summer. And what about those things you've given up, you know, popping to the dairy for milk? <laughs> <laughs> you can have your cake and eat it too. You just plan a bit more carefully. You right. Know, you have your town days yeah. and you, you plan accordingly and you squeeze it in and you catch up with people. You've been on this land for a decade now. How long will it take to build this place? We'd love to see it done in a year, but obviously there's a lot of hurdles in the way. We've got pretty limited access up here. Through the winter, you'll often see the, the gorge flooded or ice all over the roads. It may be impassable, so obviously you just need to work in amongst what the weather throws at us. How much do you think this is going to cost you? <laughs> Somewhere between three and 400000 Do you know how much the rammed earth element will cost? We're sort of so, saying around 100 grand for the walls. Does that include the complications of transportation up here? <laughs> Probably not, no. <laughs> OK, so 100 plus. Yep. Then the timber's for free plus your time on that. Yeah. yeah. But then it's the labour. Yeah. yeah. OK. Something will fit we don't, we we don't want a big mortgage out of it. That's really important to us, regardless of whether it would be accessible or not. That's not the point to us. We only want to borrow so much. So I will tell. <laughs> Lee and Michelle's ambition is well beyond the normal way of living. This place is as remote as you can get and prone to really extreme weather. And the big worry is that they don't know how much the labour cost is. And when you're building in this location, in an alternative way, it will no doubt be considerable. But you know, if anybody can do it, my money is on these two. Rammed earth houses like this contemporary high-end example near Queenstown are relatively rare, although it's a building technique that's been carried out worldwide for centuries. It's very basic, literally earth, often just from the site, compressed into walls through manual or mechanical ramming. The result is a rich, raw aesthetic that is beautiful. But I know talking to Justin Wright, who designed this house, rammed earth is not to everyone's taste. People either love it or they don't. You know, it's a unique material that's very imperfect. They're actually slightly wobbly in some parts. They're not particularly straight in some areas. And also understanding its structural properties, that it's really good to support itself. So more internal walls to kind of buttress itself. And that also really helps with the thermal properties as well. Rammed earth houses are renowned for their high thermal mass, their ability to absorb, store and release heat slowly, a big plus in terms of low energy use and sustainability. 
So it's easy to see why they're so attractive environmentally to Lee and Michelle. But what else does the couple need to consider, particularly given where they live? We are in quite a dry climate down here. So in some areas that are super wet with a lot of driven rain, it may not be as you know, mm. suitable in those areas, or the eaves need to be a lot further overhang to protect those walls from the element. Yeah, you don't want to build somewhere where you have fear of the house dissolving yeah. before your very <laughs> eyes. Washing away. Yeah. Rammed earth is an ancient form of construction, but it's certainly considered as being alternative. So will that change? Well, I think that depends on people like Lee and Michelle and inspirational houses like this. A fantastic combination of really refined contemporary architecture and this beautiful raw material. Now, that's the approach here, and Lee and Michelle's approach will be a little different, but with this as a foundation and their craftsmanship and skill, I think it's going to be a really inspiring house. Although the rammed earth builders aren't due on site until late spring, early summer, there's still plenty to do around here before construction starts in earnest. Dennis is good to go for the, the water tanks. His new truck should be actually able to get up through the gorge, and he's good to go as soon as Lane is to get the septic in and stuff. The plan is to continue renovating their Geraldine house, then sell it and move up to the mountain when the new house is finished. In the meantime, when they do come up, they stay in the old huts, making do with very little, just like the old days when they lived here full time, well off the grid. We're pretty used to the, the lifestyle of living with super minimal power, but it was a tiny little car battery and one solar panel. That tiny setup won't power building the new house, and no one wants noisy gas guzzling generators. So the solar power system has been amped up. Yeah, man, this is a pretty big milestone, really, eh? You know, it's like the first big step. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Commuting is out of the question, so electrician Zach is staying on site, giving him first-hand appreciation of mountainside life. It's pretty inspiring to see what Lee and Michelle can live with or what they can live without. Just having the basics and they seem to have a really comfortable, happy life. It really makes you rethink all the unnecessary things we have at home that we rely on when actually you can have a pretty comfortable life just with basic heating, basic lighting up in the mountains. Yeah, it's something I would love to do, but yeah, it would be such a challenge, definitely. At least one early challenge has been met, and renewable energy will now power the build. But going into winter, with snow and flooding both likely, there will certainly be more testing times to come. Spring in the South Canterbury High Country and Lee and Michelle Tane's rammed earth house has started to come out of the ground. This is looking good. Yeah, it's looking pretty good, eh? Steel looks good and sturdy and... It's um, nice to kind of get a, a feel for the actual size of the building now. The footings behind us are quite possibly excessive, um, but fabulous. They're really sound, they're really deep, really wide. We've got a heap of steel on there. Um, they've all got to support um, huge rammed earth walls, so a lot of weight. After six years of planning and a decade of dreaming, it's actually becoming tangible. It's incredible. The concrete's due to go in next, although there's still work to do on the access road so the concrete mixers can get to site. People do look at us like we're a bit crazy, wanting to put a track up here. Just getting things up here has been, yeah, a mission and a half. We've got supplies sitting down further that, you know, can't get up yet, but by the end of the week, that'll be all done. Ready for our concrete other, tracks. Which are booked for Monday. Now that things are running to a tight building timeline, the heat is really on Lee to process the timber he's collected over the years 
so that it's ready to be used on the house. There's a kilometre of timber that needs to go through the thicknesses. And I've done about 160 metres so far. <laughs> There's um, some oak there, there's some um, chestnut, um, a heap of ash, that's mostly the um, sarking. And um, we've got some native here as well, a um, bit of matai and kakatea. Just a whole, a whole selection of stuff, yeah. A lot of it is just trees that have come off properties that I suppose the value is really in the time processing it. The um, amount of handling, just getting the log to site and then preparation, cutting, stacking, drying and then resizing often a second time on the mill. It's all, yeah, very labour intensive. No question, Lee loves his timber. But there's so much work to do. You'll have to hope that he'll still love it by the end. The raw material for the couple's rammed earth walls is coming from the Cadrona Valley near Wanaka, some 300 kilometres away. The Cadrona soil has a high clay content and has proven itself on projects over the last 30 years by local rammed earth builder, Jimmy Cotter. Meeting a man with a bucket of dirt. Yeah. This will be good. <laughs> well, nice to meet you. Yeah, you yeah. too, you too. So this is the stuff. This is it? That's, uh, it's, it's quite dry. It is a tactile experience. It is. It's a real natural, it sort of living product. What makes the perfect rammed earth material? Yeah, well, you sort of need the right amount of clay and the right amount of aggregate and sand. Is it cement to stabilise? Correct, and only about 10%. And then you do your tests, your erosion tests, your shrink test and your strength test, and then that lets you know whether it's suitable or not. Oh, you, you've got to try it. Try it? Yeah. It's part of what you mean. You know, every client, you know, gonna, you've got to have a wee, a wee sample. Why would you? Why would you do that? It's it's just part of having earth, literally. Okay. Well, it's a bit gritty. Yeah. Yep. Tastes like dirt. Now, yeah. Now you can do rammed earth. Okay. So that's the initiation. That's right. That's right. So this is where you get it from. Correct. Yeah. So you can see that it's vertical so you know that it's going to hold well when that's got no cement, no stabiliser, so we know the product's good. Brand Earth's been in New Zealand for 150 years, so it's a product that's done New Zealand well, and I'd love to see it more. It's a beautiful house to live in, nice and cool. The temperature range is just so constant, nice and warm in the winter and cool in the summer, so, yeah. What about Geraldine, then? So, Lee and Michelle, yes. their place. The fact that they've lived off site on that remote site and off grid, and the fact he's, you know, got all the timber himself and machined it, and it's just a lovely story. And I'm yeah. uh, really excited about going there and helping them fulfil their dream, and I'm, I'm very proud to be part of it. The wet and cold of winter is not ideal for rammed earth building. So Jimmy and his team have waited until late spring. Now they've moved in for the next couple of weeks and have made a start with 65 cubic metres, that's about 90 tonnes, of Cadrona Valley soil trucked all the way up here. Much like in situ concrete walls, the first step is to create boxing to hold the earth in place. The earth is made just damp enough to hold together and compress when it's rammed. Lee and Michelle are working in Geraldine today, but are fine for me to come up and have a look. What I wasn't expecting was the offer to have a go myself. Jump straight into there, mate. Yeah. Feet down. Box the rebar. Yep. Yeah, it, it's tight, isn't it? Very. Yeah. Very. OK. And this is the rammer. Yep. It's Bertha. Bertha? So, yep. <laughs> All right, here we go. What do you think? Doing well. Doing well for the first time. Uh, you know what? I enjoyed that, but I think uh, I think I let the experts do it. <laughs> I 
with the builders not needing any more assistance from me, I head to Geraldine and Lee's workshop. He's already put in a full day with his arborist business. Now, amongst other pressing jobs, his day continues crafting bespoke cabinetry and furniture for the new house. I'm kind of running around doing multiple things at once, kind of too many projects on the go. I'm trying to do all the kitchen joinery, or all the furniture for the house, as well as, you know, the other bits of timber for the house. And then they need some different timber for bracing and bits and pieces, so I had to drop a few things and go and mill extra timber so they've got the right stuff available. Usually get up at five, do a couple of hours of woodwork in the morning, head out, do a day's work, come back, start cooking dinner and looking after the kids. Yeah, but uh, um, it sounds exhausting. I can hear it a little bit in your <laughs> voice, actually. <laughs> big days at the moment. Yeah, yeah, big days. And big news, too. Negotiating with the bank over the mortgage has taken so long, it's forced a change of plan for the Geraldine property. Need to sell the house a lot sooner than we'd um, kind of anticipated, six months earlier. It's just been difficult with all the different um, conditions that they've asked us to meet, and it's just taking time, you know, the time frame on it all. It's not yeah. going to marry up with needing to pay the builders. And where will you live then? Oh, the little huts up on the block. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. It'll only be for a short time. OK. Now Lee's putting on a brave face, but I suspect it will be a fair bit longer than that through next winter and beyond, depending, of course, on if the new house is completed on schedule. And when it comes to building, as we all know, that's a very big if. It's December, and Michelle and Lee's rammed earth house is steadily taking shape, and Michelle can now begin to visualize where everything goes. We are in the kitchen at the moment. And so we're going to have wraparound benches here, large kitchen island with seating. Um, over to this side, we're going to have a beautiful, large uh, home wood stove, which is a wood stove, a bit like a coal range, but run on wood. And that is going to be powering our hot water cylinders. Um, it's going to be powering our radiators, and we're going to be able to cook in it a pergola eventually coming out, a banquet table probably made out of oak that Lee will build, and then sort of like an outdoor fire at one end. This has always been the dream, to find a piece of land and live simple but live well. Oh, this one's heavy. The walls going up successfully has put a smile on Lee's face. Not that he's got any time to celebrate with so much timber to process. Yeah, these are our um, window lentils. A lot of hard work, <laughs> a lot of time, a lot of moving. So um, you pick them up, put them on the mill, take them off, roll them around, put them somewhere else, oil them, pick them up, move them somewhere else again. It's a bit of a tight spot here, so it's like constant jiggling. <laughs> The couple are also taking delivery of an early Christmas present. Two concrete box culvert units, weighing 10 tonnes each, are slowly trucked up the access road and across the river fords. Typically, culvert units like these are used for drainage or tunnels, but not here. It's actually two box culverts that are going to slot together, be welded, and then we've had um, fabricated a custom back and front, including the door, so that it can be all sealed up as one structurally sound unit. And that will be um, a food cellar, the food preservation. So all the produce that we grow, the meat that we harvest, can all go into jars and all go into the cellar. Although the cellar wasn't on the original plans, with the landscaping being done now, the time is right. The seller's ultimately going to save them a lot of money, but it's a big expense up front. I would pick that we wouldn't get much change out of 30 grand for this, yeah. Yep, so instead of another bedroom, perhaps, <laughs> we have a cellar. Mm. Michelle and Lee's renovated villa in Geraldine is now on the market, 
And when it sells, the family will move into their mountain huts until their new house is ready. What are you most excited about living in the huts again? Like to run around and play there. Are you going to miss this place? Um, no. I got to like being in the water. Yeah. Now, Thea spent her first 18 months living in the old huts, so she's a veteran, and young Juniper is not far behind. Their parents, though, weren't intending to sell up a move so soon, and overwintering in the old wooden huts with two under fives wasn't in the plan. Hopefully we get a dry season, so it's going to be a bit more testing with two young children this time. It'd be a little bit different actually living there and trying to squeeze all our stuff into those two small spaces. Maybe two or three months would be, after that we'll be in winter. No, it'll be all done by then, we'll be living in the house. Because <laughs> that's how these projects go. That's how these projects go. <laughs> By April, with the Geraldine house still not sold, the family continues travelling up whenever possible to make the most of the lifestyle and to check progress on the build. Hey, you got some puddles to jump in. On site, a reinforced concrete bond beam has been installed, critical to tie together all of the unbraced rammed earth walls. That has been um, new for our local builders, uh, something that hasn't been done before because rammed earth is new for them. So we're all in here doing things for the first time. Even at this early stage, parts of this house are pretty much done. The rammed earth walls and concrete floor are complete. But what goes in next will take this house to another level altogether. We're looking really forward to seeing the timber going in to help kind of soften that industrial feel of all this concrete and hard um, walls. It's very much the next stage is timber, all timber, 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 to bring all that warmth into the house, to soften all these hard lines and cold surfaces, just all that warmth and colour. With the build moving on to the structural timber elements, attention will focus now on Lee's processing and preparation and just how well he's done it. Well, these are the, all the oak rafters. The thing that's interesting about the New Zealand oak is that it's a lot heavier and a lot stronger than European oak uh, of the same um, species. But with that, it is renowned for movement while it dries, so it's the tricky thing. So you can see that some of them are quite twisted, and that's going to create a, a bit of a drama trying to install them just to get them to fit right. Once it is dry, it's incredibly stable. It doesn't keep moving. And it's also very durable, and it's also very, very strong. We're hoping to build something that will last maybe 500 years, but with as little maintenance as possible. And that's why we're trying to go top quality on everything to reduce that kind of maintenance cost in the future. Lee's cherished oak beams may not appear to be perfect, and it remains to be seen what the builders will think about twisted beams and how much trouble they could be. In the South Canterbury High Country, winter's on the way and the builders staying on site are keen to get the roof on Lee and Michelle's house. An impressive feature are the New Zealand oak beams that Lee milled and processed himself. They've got some character to them in regards to some bends and twists that you, you know, wouldn't really normally get. And being oak, it's not like you can manoeuvre it into place too much, so they're pretty set in their ways. But as far as the timber itself, it's, it's a privilege to work with it. You just don't get a chance to work with this type of thing that much. To counteract any twists in the oak, the builders have come up with a twist of their own. I've made this epic big spanner to crank the, the beams down into place where there's a little bit of twist in them. So, yeah, that's actually worked out with no worries. 
spend years kind of, you know, cutting them and shuffling them around, oiling them, uh, moving the stacks here and there, and actually to finally see them actually in their, you know, their resting place. Um, just absolutely stoked with how it's turned out. Pig on the loose on the building site. Conan, get, get. Fear and juniper are really thriving here. So close to nature, and even a little lost piglet. Isn't she lovely? Yeah. She's isn't she? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's not going to survive the winter. She's too small without a mum. So we'll see if somebody wants to um, take on an orphan. Uh, oh, let's jump past. Absolutely loving the wild feeling of up, up here. They've made the adjustment like overnight, and they're just loving it. It's a small moment of light relief in amongst the serious business of getting this house completed. The wild winter weather is just around the corner. Liam Michelle's Geraldine house has now sold, and the family's moved full time into the old wooden huts on the mountainside. It's the life that they love but they'd rather be living in the new house. On the plus side, though, seeing all the progress is a real treat. Gosh, it's just so elemental, isn't it? It's beautiful. It's been, you know, years of working with each piece individually, but it's finally seeing it all put together, you know, as it's supposed to be is, wow, yeah. And the other thing that really impresses me is the scale of these openings which you don't get a sense of until you're at this stage, actually. You can stand here and admire the view, which is beyond the clouds. It's always cloudy when I'm here. <laughs> I'm hoping for a sunny day sometime. Yeah, the views are so beautifully framed. Um, it's amazing seeing everything dimensionally now. They're beautiful walls. I don't think there's any imperfections that bother me in the slightest. Well, it's kind of perfect imperfections, right? Mm. They are, they that... are. That's what gives it the character. I mean, if we wanted perfect, we would have gone for jib and plaster, but we yeah. haven't. We've gone for um, materials that showcase um, their natural beauty. They've done an incredible job. I'm, I'm just amazed by it, yeah. It looks great. So is there a bit of pressure as well at the moment? Because, you know, winter is rapidly coming up the mountain to meet you. Yeah, the seasons are changing pretty quickly, and from here on in, we could expect snow any time. Any time? Mm, any time. Mm. Yeah, you need those windows. We need windows. Windows <laughs> would be great. Yeah. Although the plan was to be in the new house by winter, that hasn't happened. But all the windows are in, and the furniture is nearly finished. And spirits are high. We've been really lucky this winter. It's actually been quite mild. You know, obviously, we've had some pretty cold snaps, but a lot of really nice sunny days. We'd actually really hoped to be living in the house before the winter, but we've ended up having to be working on the build all winter and living in the huts. It's been quite challenging at times, but at other times, it's just been an absolute pleasure Spending the time together, working together. I just come here with you guys. All of the builders and contractors have now left, leaving Lee and Michelle to finish the internal fit out themselves. This will certainly keep the final cost down, but means Lee especially is on the tools all hours. And even though he's passionate about timber, he's not actually a qualified builder. I've never built internal walls. I've never put down a floor before, apart from the huts, you know, but that was quite different. It was all very rough and rustic. But here, you know, I'm trying to go for straight lines and levels. It was very challenging. I'm pretty lucky to have a good helper that enjoys oiling. Yeah, you are. Between working on the house and looking after Thea and Juniper, Lee and Michelle keep money coming in through their agricultural business. Michelle handles all the admin and takes the concept of working from home to a whole new level. So this is my office. Um, I get reception up here. So when I want to do any accounting or check on invoices, and um, this is the place to come. Michelle's also keeping a very close eye on the construction budget that the couple had hoped to keep to around $400,000. The costs have got to a point where we've reached just like the outside our comfort zone 
hence why it's good that it's just us finishing it up now that allows us to sort of restrict how much we borrow and keep that manageable. With us doing so much of the build now, um, our schedule for furnishing the home with our own designs and timbers has changed. Um, it'll be six to 12 months uh, behind on that schedule, yeah. Now, I don't think the delay in getting the furniture made will be the end of the world for this family, who are so capable, so adaptable. But going over budget, that's different and clearly disappointing. It's a bit of a hit, but at the same time, you know, we've got a dream and we're just going for it. And when things change or we have to adapt, then that's what we do. We're changing and adapting and, um, you know, we want to see this dream through. You know, you figure out a way. You know, you adjust. Building a house is certainly a process of adjustment. And how you react to change so often determines success or otherwise. I said at the beginning, my money is on these two. It's been very tough and it's not yet over. But I do look forward to collecting. So this is it, isn't it? I'm in a very smart car, in a slightly underpressed shirt. And so any moment now, a beautifully designed home is going to slide into view and I'll say, well, there it is. But the amazing thing about this story is that that home is miles away. But this is a significant moment because we are about to leave the tar seal and embrace Liam Michelle's mountain realm. is exactly how you'd want a mountain house to be. Robust, strong, and beautiful snow-capped mountains in the background. Well, hello. How are you? Oh, I'm fantastic. How are you? You, you good, too. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Good day. Hey, good day. Well, I don't know what the right mountain greeting is. Do I yodel or? Please show us your yodel. That'd be fantastic. Maybe later. <laughs> I'm glad I got to the end of the road, because this is a real treat. Come have a look. OK. Oh. Welcome to the kitchen. <laughs> what a kitchen. It's just a riot of beautiful timber, detail, materials everywhere. It's lovely, it's isn't it? Huge material presence. Yeah. All the joinery is walnut, and then all the um, detailing is oak. There's this feeling that this place has been made, crafted, and we know the person who's done that. Yeah, well, I've um, thrown a few bits of wood together, but the, the design and the ideas of very much shells. He's done a gorgeous job with Throwing some wood together, <laughs> he says. Yeah, beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. The rammed earth wall now just carved out these little niches with books and plants. Competing with this beautiful timber is this grunty stove. This is the heart of the house, right? This is the heating, it's the radiators, it's the hot water and it's the cooking. And yeah. it's fabulous. We're so happy with it. Yes, now I remember standing here just admiring what I thought would be your view because it was always a, there was a cloud here. But now today, clear and stunning facing that mountain. Oh, it was very much about having our living space and the view and the garden all. And framing it, enjoying it, soaking it up every day. So if that's the case, why have you planted this giant boulder <laughs> right there? <laughs> right in front I of love the couch, it. yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting move. <laughs> Always loved, loved big boulders. And yeah. we had the opportunity and we took it. <laughs> this house is full of opportunities taken. Moments where Lee and Michelle's personalities and their life values are expressed. The raw earth walls are quietly assertive and combined with the exposed concrete bomb beams evoke a feeling of honesty and conviction. The walls also contrast brilliantly with the satin polished concrete floors, their deep oxide tint providing a foil for the soft flaxen tones of the rammed earth. Now this is novel. You, you kind of got the corner taken out of your room. It's very open, lots of light, lots of air, very free flow. 
There's a real tectonic to this building. You can feel how this building's been put together. Yeah, it really showcases all the materials in this space in a condensed sort of form. Yeah, it's earthy and tight, isn't it? And then there's this transition to timber and a, a kind of woodland kingdom in there. That's the, the kids' room, right? Shell's really wanted this room quite whimsical for the children. I love it, and the kids must love it. They do. They, they absolutely adore love it. it. Yeah. Now, the last room in the house. Have you saved the best till last? You tell me. Well, you might have done. My favourite room. Right. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I love the feel of this room. It's kind of got like a, a sauna-like feel to it. You can stargaze as you have your evening shower. And then, well, there's no privacy there. None needed, yeah. Very impressive. Isn't this great? I'm perched on one of the stools that you made, and it's easy to be seduced by what you've done. It must feel amazing. It's very surreal. We've finally put down our roots in yeah. a permanent, hopefully forever home. It really does feel quality and permanent and solid, and I imagine this place covered in snow and you feeling completely protected. It had to be something solid, it had to be something permanent. It's got to be fitting for its harsh environment. But what about the things you have now permanently given up? I mean, you had internet where the builders were here. That's now gone. You just don't need it all the time. It's a luxury, not a necessity. And, and when you are consciously using it, your life is richer for it. Mm, it's a short walk to the top of the hill where we've got full reception. Lovely walk. Yeah. We read books yeah. or play cards or talk listen to or music. listen to music. Yeah. yeah. And again, life feels richer for it. So let's put some figures on this. 150,000 for the land, I think it was. And then your ambition at the beginning was 300 to 400,000 spend on the project. Mm, things have changed dramatically. Mm. And we realized that the figure would change with that. Where are you now? <laughs> Significantly higher. We're sitting a little under 600,000, maybe five, it's about five, eight, five eight or something yeah. like that, just, just for the home. You have amazing value for what you spent. I mean, clearly, clearly here, it is uh, just a dream. For most people, well, you've done it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we so often judge buildings by the architectural fashions of the time. But to do so here would seem slightly disingenuous, because even though this building is on point, full of material choices, craftsmanship, and design elements that would grace the pages of any highbrow architectural journal, its true value lies in its elegant purpose, its appropriateness to this remote mountain environment, and the fact that it provides the cornerstone to Lear Michel's philosophy for an alternative and enriching lifestyle is just some kind of wonderful.